And welcome back to Bayou Time. I'm Martin Foss, and I want to talk about someone who was on our show quite a bit. It's Frances Parr, Frances Marie Parr, for those of you who know her. And what a life she had. Passed away at 105 in those 105 years, so instrumental in this area. And I wanted to also inform everyone that on Saturday, January 27th, from 9 a.m. until service time, at St. Francis, I mean, sorry, St. Gregory Catholic Church, a mass of Christian burial will begin at 10 a.m. at the church with burial and military honors following at St. Francis de Sales Cemetery No. 1. She is survived by her brother, James Gilbert Parr, and numerous nieces and nephews. She is preceded in death by her parents, Francis Parr, and Liddy DuPont Poor, and brothers Ralph Poor and Ernest Poor, sisters Betty Poor and Joyce Burns. And if we could, I want to roll in some footage on her 105th birthday. We'll roll this in as B-roll. I'll continue to talk a little bit about Miss Parr because I did a one-on-one -on -one with her. We covered numerous birthday parties. We also covered her. You know, there is her niece, Donna Parr, who was talking during the birthday. But we covered her at Terrebonne High when she was presented this year. And there you see Miss Parr right there in the middle. She was the oldest of six children. She became a teacher at 18 years old right after graduating from Terrebonne High School in 1934. She graduated in 1937 from Louisiana State Normal College in Natchitoches. She was an experienced world traveler, often taking her nieces and nephews. She was a decorated veteran and beloved aunt and the true picture of a hometown hero. And I wonder if we have her banner on Barrow Street along with my dad and others. I'm going to make sure that that is up because she certainly deserves it. And in February of 1943, she signed up for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WAC, to serve her country in World War II. She was discharged from the military in October 1945, receiving several medals over her lifetime and two commendations from generals for her exceptional work. She continued her work as a teacher after returning to Homa for five years and then working for the Day Insurance Agency until her retirement in 1980. Miss Poor organized the VFW Auxiliary in Homa and served as its first president in the Homa Duplicate Bridge Club, serving as director for over 20 years. She was the first person in Terrebonne Parish to be awarded Life Master by the American Contract League. The family would like to thank the Homestead staff for sitters and Haydell Memorial Hospice especially Nancy Fosho, for treating her like family, taking such good care of her throughout these last few years. Ordoin Funeral Home is in charge of the arrangements. And certainly, uh, once again, she was just a great interview. She had so much pizzazz, so much confidence, so much history to give to us at HTV. We're going to run... All of those excerpts right after this obituary that I'm doing right now, but that's going to be on Facebook and YouTube. And we're going to run uh, the different specials we had on her because you need to really listen to the history that she shares and uh, what a legacy she leaves for her entire family. And I know they're very saddened by her departure here on earth, but she's got a place up there a good place because she was a good woman, served the country well, served their community well, served their family well, and served her fellow members well. She was always so kind to us at HTV. So what we'll do, we'll queue up uh, that part on the 105 birthday party, and we'll roll that in for the remainder of this segment. But then once again on Facebook and YouTube, you can see a lot more. God bless Miss Parr. I'm Donna. I am her niece, and she's taking care of us 
all our lives. She's always done good things for us, so now we're taking care of her. This is Jamie Parr and my dad, Jimmy Parr, who's 95 years old, at his sister Frances Marie's 105th birthday. Uh, the youngest of the six siblings, and Miss Frances is the oldest of the six. Proud to have her as an aunt. I read a I read a uh, article recently where she mentioned bringing all of her nieces and nephews uh, on trips, and I'm one of those benefactors. She brought me to Disney World, and she brought a cousin and I on a cruise. We love her very much, and want to wish her a great 105th birthday. I'm just glad she's still living. Okay. 106. Not many people get there. My name is Derek Bovelin. That's my wife Emily. Um, Miss Mimi to me is uh, 105 years old. Uh, I am her great nephew. Uh, I wish, I hope I have that gene to live 105 years old. I think it's great. And of course, they were talking in the present, but that's the way Miss Paul would have loved to have had it. And certainly, uh, our condolences go out to the entire family. And uh, I'm smiling because she had such a great life. She really did. 105. Can you imagine that? She was able to touch so many family members along the way. Don't forget, Facebook, YouTube, we're going to load up those one-on-ones and everything else we could find in the archives. And once again, our condolences to the entire family. this episode of One on One, we're going to take you back through some great years and we're going to share them with Miss Frances Parr, who celebrated her 100th birthday just recently. And trust me, you're going to be very impressed. We're going to find out the secret, how she keeps that energy. It's all next. And welcome back to One on One. I'm Martin Falls, and as promised, our guest tonight is Miss Frances Poor. There you see her. And Miss Poor, I want to thank you first of all for being on the program. It's an honor to interview someone who served in the military, someone who's reached 100 years young, because you are 100 years young. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to start with a traditional question that we ask our guest, but I'm really curious as to what you're going to tell me. I want you to go as far back as you can remember. Where were you born and what was it like in those days? I was born in Homer on uh, McKinley Street. And uh, there was a bridge or, in that area across by Terrebonne, and my grandparents lived across the bayou. I do remember uh, going to uh, kindergarten on Gold's Avenue, and I walked there, even though I was only five years old. There was no uh, Southern Avenue. There was just a fence across that way. And so I crossed only one street. Humber was really, really small then. So it was pretty compact, the city limits were not that expanded back in those no, days. No, no. Mm -hmm. How about this This studio you're sitting in was the DuPont store. Do you remember the DuPont store? I remember very well. My, my mother was a DuPont. I didn't know that. You just told me something new. <laughs> and, and what was the store like back in the day? It was very, very different from what it became later. It, when you say a general merchandise store, it really was. I remember that's where we always bought uh, wedding presents, birthday presents, and uh, clothing for everybody in the family, as well as groceries and uh, hardware. You grew up in the fledgling days of Terrebonne Parish, or Homa for that matter, and you've watched it grow over the years. How, how have you seen it grow? I do remember when uh, the first uh, oil discovery around here was we, we had an influx of people and that's when begin, things began to pick up a little bit. I went to uh, St. Francis de Sales Girls School on uh, Point in Barrow Street 
until through seventh grade anyway. And then I went to high school at the old building, you know, where the uh, courthouse annex is now. Right. Uh, I went to school there and I taught there. Who were some of your teachers that you remember back in school? Most of them were relatives because <laughs> I, I sort of became a teacher by accident. That on both sides of my family, there were teachers, and they just assumed I was going to go to college and be a teacher. Mama's uh, half-sister, Clara, her, her half-brother, uh, Carol, who was a, a principal at Homer Elementary, and after he retired, he was a member of the legislature. Uh, my Aunt Una taught 40-odd uh, years French at Terrebonne High School, and often people confuse her with me because my first job at Terrebonne High was teaching first-year French. It was the, the old French and not the French that I learned at <laughs> Vanderbilt, right? That's right. So if I say, comment ça va, would, would that be correct in, in your French language? Yes, yeah, well, some of it is. Okay. It's just a variation. My father thought he, thought he thought, uh, spoke French, but he really didn't. It was, like you say, the, the ordinary language here. So I can remember my parents speaking in French when they did not want us to hear <laughs> what they right. were talking about. Did you do the same? No, no, we never spoke French at home, never. That's good. So, so you were around when French was a predominant language, and then it became English, right? That's right. And so, was that culture shock back then for you all, or did you just but go with the flow? Just go with the flow, that's right. It seems to me like you probably went with the flow many times, <laughs> and you, you seem very laid back. You seem like nothing really bothers you too much. Did anything really bother you? No, there's no point in it unless it, you can change it, you know. Right. So you just sort of went about things, and if you had any hurdles in life, you crossed them and you kept going. Whatever happened just happened. Tell me about your, your family, uh, longevity. That seems like a lot of people in your family have lived long. That's true. Not, well, when I was growing up, uh, anybody 70 years old was ancient, you know. But uh, most of them uh, lived to a pretty good age. What was school like when you went to school? What, how hard were the teachers? Were they, we hear they were very strict back then. That's right. What was it like? Well, you know, my first uh, seven years were at, a, at the convent, and then I went to Terrebonne High. At Terrebonne High at that time, the boys had to wear a tie, and chewing gum was an offense that had to be sent to the office, to the principal's office, because that was forbidden, absolutely forbidden. I can't get over the change when I look to see what the children are wearing to school today. You see pants sort of hanging below? <laughs> The red, that's got to drive you crazy, huh? And, and the blue jeans, especially the ones, you remember uh, at one time it was fashionable to wear a tear up, b b blue jeans all torn and draggy. Right. I couldn't stay in that. Ooh. It's like, why pay all that money for holes in your <laughs> jeans, right? <laughs> but it sort of became the thing to do. So you were brought up very conservative, and I guess that sort of stuck with you your whole life, right? That's, that's true. Right. We um, went to church re religiously, went to catechism. Even though I went to a convent school, I had to go to catechism to uh, make my first communion. And so I, don't, I guess you remember Dr. Philip Sadak? Absolutely. He, he lived around the corner from me. Well, he and I would often walk to and from St. Francis Church for our lessons. Everybody walked everywhere, you know. And the children were free to walk on the street. Uh, our parents didn't worry about us. And you didn't have cell phones either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so didn't even have telephones. You actually had to talk to people, right? I do. I like to talk, but I don't like to make a, a, a speech. I mean, I just talk. Right, right. But I guess in those days, communication was when you were sitting down at a dinner table with the family. You didn't have people texting each other, and they <laughs> text right. each other at the same table now. That's correct. And now that drives me crazy. I can imagine it drives you crazy. <laughs> so you didn't have cell phones. You said no phones when 
in the house when you were growing up? And when I was very small, eventually uh, there were telephones in Terrebonne, and of course uh, there were two women operators. You had to pick up the receiver, and I, she would say, "Number, please," and you had to give the number vo uh, vocally, and she would punch it in. I had to learn how to do that in the uh, army when I was on duty at night because we each had to take turns to be on duty, and I. I it took me a little while to catch on to how the telephones worked. Well, so they actually had Miss Kravitz, like we would call her, sitting at the switchboard. Mm -hmm. But they could listen to everything you were saying too, right? Well, not only that, we had uh, people who had party lines. And I would often at a house with the phone would ring, that first ring, everybody stopped Everything stopped, and everybody listened to the, for the number of rings so you know which receiver to pick up. And right. after the person who was being called picked up the receiver, all the other receivers were picked up too, so everybody knew everybody's business. <laughs> so you better be careful what you're saying on the party line. <laughs> That's right. And I think one ring would be, I think they had four homes per party line. That's right. So if it rang once, it might be your house. It rang twice, it might be the neighbor. That's right. But like you said, everybody was picking up. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. So when did it, do you remember around the year that you got your own phone, your home got your own phone, and you were like, wow, we have our own phone now? Let's see, our number was 388, so we were number 388 in Homer who got a telephone. And that was in the 20s sometimes. Were you intrigued by that technology at that point? It didn't bother me. It was, it was just there. Yeah, just something. To, but did the phone ring a lot? No, not that I recall. Mm -mm. So let me ask so you, you're going through school and you're learning your subjects. Who were some of the people you hung around with? Who were your friends? Usually the ones with uh, last names that began to O-P-R because everybody was listed alphabetically everywhere. Now, you know, in high school, uh, we went only through 11th grade. There was no 12th grade. And that's why I finished high school when I was barely 16. Were you pretty smart? Not particularly. I, I wasn't the studious type, but it came to me easily. So you were natural. It was natural yeah. to you. Now, I asked about your friends who were who were some of the people you hung around with? Ernestine Ellender, well, Ernestine Boudreaux Ellender, if you didn't know, Dr. Ernest Ellender's wife was in my class. We were very good friends. In high school, I made friends with uh, people from all over the parish because this was the only high school in the parish. And so there were school buses coming from every direction. Were you a serious type or were you the class clown or what no, were you like? I was more the serious type. Okay. I had to learn to be serious because I was the eldest of the six of us, and uh, I was always having to watch the others, so I had to be the model. Yeah, you had to lead by example. Yeah. And, and who were your siblings? Huh? You said you were one of six, right? Right. And was it brothers, sisters? I had two sisters and three brothers. And so I want to sort of morph into the military. When did you, and I want to first thank you for your service to our country. I, I mean, oh, no. it's an honor to sit here and talk to someone who can bring a lot of history to us. When did you know, or when were you notified that you were going to be in the service? It was sort of the thing to do. You see, uh, when they started getting w women in the service, uh, it took a little while to get organized. So it was in the spring of 43 that a friend from, who was a fellow teacher at high school uh, and I went to New Orleans and took the test just to find out if we could pass, you know, to go into the service. Of course, being school teachers, we, we aced through all the tests, written tests and things like that. She went into the Marines and I went into the Army. I don't know why I selected the Army, but I did. You were part of the WACs. The first ones were called W-A-A-C, okay. Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And then oh, within about six months, they were shortened into W-A-C. At first, 
and the men saw in the charge sort of didn't know what to do with the women because they had for the men all these procedures to follow, all these pamphlets, all these uh, training films and so on. So they had to adapt it, all of that to the women. And it was kind of funny sometimes, the things that happened, yeah. but they just did. They just did the best they could, trying to teach us what to, how, to, how to be military. And so how did that work out? What, were, what was the women's role or the woman's role in the war? to put women in offices, uh, typists, telephone operators, and things like that, to release men for active duty. And then when we went overseas, that's exactly what we did. We took over the office positions at headquarters, and the men were released for active duty. And some of them really resented that. But on the other hand, some of them were glad to see us because those who had already served two or three years in North Africa had earned enough points that could go, they could come home. And so as soon as we got settled in the place, they began to, to come back to the States. At what age was it that you get called to duty? When did you go take the test? In 43? In 43, and uh, long about February. But you see, I was teaching. And so they let me finish the school year, okay. and I went on duty on uh, June the 1st. What was that like? Was that the first time once you started going away from home? What was that like? Well, I had done that in college. I had gone to school in Natchitoches. And so I knew what it was like to be away from home and be with a group of people, like a group of women in a building. So I had no problem with that. So you were pretty independent at that point? Yes. Okay, but what was it like? What are some of the areas that you saw because you were involved in the wax? Well, I saw a fair amount of the, of the uh, uh, United States because first we were set up to uh, Fort Devons in Massachusetts for basic training. Then after that, when it was decided that the company I was with was going to go overseas, we were sent down to Fort Oglethorpe in Georgia, and we had to practice tramping around the mountains, wearing gas masks and uh, knapsacks on our back and learning how to follow directions and so on. And I could, never could figure out what they expected us to do because <laughs> we were supposed to be office workers. Right. And uh, just before we were leaving uh, Fort Oglethorpe, we were assigned winter clothing. And then the final was, it gave us leggings, which I thought looked like they had been left over from World War I. And I never could figure out how typists and op telephone operators needed to wear leggings with their dresses. You were in a state of flux. You didn't know why you were doing some of the things, Didn't right? know where we were going or why. And then after we left Fort Oglethorpe by troop train again, we went to uh, Cape Patrick Henry in Virginia. We had to learn how to go down the side of a ship or the rope ladder and uh, always uh, keep everything black. You couldn't have any uh, windows open and so on. We went overseas by ourselves. There was no convoy. So we zigzagged across the, uh, the ocean. And then when we got near to where we were supposed to go, we couldn't because the Germans had blocked the Strait of Gibraltar. So we had to sail down Africa a, a little ways, and we landed at Casablanca, and where the Moroccan government required that we be uh, quarantined for 15 days, and they were not prepared for us. So it was a company of uh, GIs there, and what they did was cut down some trees to get the trunks of trees to make cots, and this uh, stretch some what I call chicken wire uh, between those posts, no, no blankets, no, no covering for the wire or anything. So what we had to do, fortunately, we each had two army blankets. We had to use two army blankets for the mattress and double up and, and use two army blankets to cover us because it was cold down there at Casablanca at night. Mm -hmm. And the windows on the head or wood shutters, and they only closed them for part of the night. It was, it was really very cool. But you did what we had to do. You had to be a pretty tough lady to go through what you 
Were you always that tough or did you become tough because of what you went through? Well, because I was the oldest, I guess I had to make decisions and take care, help take care of the youngest. Oh, well, that part was easy. Uh, after we left Casablanca, we went by a 40 and 8 train. You know what I mean, a 40 and 8? I don't. Oh, okay. During World War I, when troops were transferred around in uh, France and on the boxcars, and I saw that because they, they were still there, uh, they put carot arm o wheat chevaux. In other words, each box car would hold 40 men or eight horses. And that's why they were called the 40 and 8 trains. We went across the top of Africa from Morocco uh, to Oran in Algeria. And it was very, very cold that night. They, we had, I was, they happened to be in the fourth uh, quarter, and we had iron benches to sit on all night. When we got to Oran, oh, the ship wasn't ready for us, so they pitched canvas tents on the sands of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And everything was all right, except we never had hot water. And we could not wash our clothes because that whenever the ship arrived, we were leaving and we had to get on board ship within one hour. It was okay. It was just cold. But you know, I never knew of any member of the company ever being sick at any time, no matter what happened, where we were or what. And then a ship finally arrived and we got on it and went in the Mediterranean, never knowing where we were going to go until we landed in the Bay of Naples. Then and we had and to you run. hear about these areas today, still in the news for conflicts, but it's a little different today than it was back then. Well, the bay was filled with overturned ships because the Germans were trying to keep the supply ships from getting into uh, Naples. And so what they had to do was build a ramp across the side of the largest ship, fortunately it was uh, both sides for us to hold on to, and we had to walk on the side of a ship to get to the pier because we just couldn't get to the pier. It was so full. That was okay. What really annoyed me was the air raids at night. I didn't mind the air raids so much if they came once a night, but when they came twice a night, it was plum aggravating. Yeah. We had to be in bed by 10 o'clock. We had to be at, seated at our desk at work at eight o'clock in the morning till five in the afternoon, six and a half days a week. And having to get up twice a night to go from the sixth floor down to the sub basement where the uh, air raid shelter was, was a, a nuisance. And had to do that in the dark. And as soon as the air raid was over, we would go back up, get in bed, try to sleep real fast, because about two o'clock in the morning, here would come another air raid. But you know, it was really strange. Every time we had a rare air raid, there were a few GIs hanging around the neighborhood, and they just had to come to our air raid shelter. And so they saw all these wax in their pajamas and robes, and, but we visited with them. We all had a good time. It helped pass the time while you were just sitting around waiting right. to go back. Talking about the air raid, that had to be a little spooky to hear that going off and then to hear the bombing going on. Yes. Well, we were, we were at the port. We lived at the port, you see, and then we're bombing the ships in the port most of the day. And it, it was kind of annoying, the noise. But down there, you didn't hear very much. No. But you speak of it sort of matter of factly, like it was just part of history. Were you scared? Actually, I never was. I just assumed that everything would be fine. Yeah. So you had faith in yeah. the United States that they would prevail. Yeah. I, and one of the streets one night, I don't know why I was late getting back to uh, headquarters, and I was able to see the red tracer bullets, and I thought, why in the world could I have, couldn't I have seen some of those before? I wasn't even afraid in the street. I, I knew everything was going to be all right. Well, good for you. I'm seeing the honor roll of Terrebonne Wax, and I'm <laughs> looking through your scrapbook. I see very familiar names like Boulanger, Bourgeois, Broussard, Cheney, Daspit, I guess have the Daspit Street, Jacuzzo, Kennedy, Landry, LaBeouf, Lede, Parr, 
Piku, uh, Poirier, Robichaux, Robichaux, another Robichaux, three Robichauxs, and two Songe. They had a lot of local women involved in the military, didn't they? That's so, right. so Terrebonne did their part. Oh, they definitely did. School teachers, you know, were given all the jobs that men were too busy to handle. We had to register the men for the draft. Mm -hmm. We had to uh, go to uh, various uh, plantations and uh, register all the employees, everyone on the plantation for ration cards, yes. And uh, one of the school teachers uh, organized us into a, a little drill. She would, uh, or we would drill around the terrible uh, school and learn how to do that. Uh, uh, Mrs. Dasby, who had been a nurse, taught uh, home uh, nursing, which I didn't like. But uh, all the teachers were expected to do extra things all the time. Now, I mean this in all due respect because you're a beautiful woman, no. but I'm looking at your picture in uniform here. I bet you had the men going crazy. No, indeed. <laughs> no, indeed. But you they know. were all, all very, very nice. We you had a great had. smile. Look at that smile. I didn't know they let you smile when you took uniform pictures, but you were smiling away in this Well, I, I knew some of the photographers, and prob probably one of them had taken it. Wow, that's a great picture. And then I see what they call the dog tag, but there's a little indention in the dog tag. What was that for? And that was in case uh, they had to identify uh, a person uh, who had died, and they would put the dog tag between the two front teeth because that was a good place for whoever was re picking up the bodies or whatever or could find out who they were. And it, it, and it seems so morbid, but it, it was really very simplistic in being able to place that so that families at home would be able to have some closure and they would at least that, identify. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the tough part of, of war. But I see also your bars and, your, and you have your patches uh, accumulated. What were some of the honors or what were some of the things you remember most about your time? My office was different from all the others in the company, would you believe? I, today you would call it public relations. I don't remember what they called it. In my office, the boss went out to the, in the field to the different camps to get information about what those, that particular group of men did and would get names and addresses and come back and write a general article about what they did, leaving the uh, top page free to fill in the, the uh, GI's name and home address and so on. And we sent that to the newspapers at home. I look through this, this grab book, I see a Western Union oh. telegram that says, report to Army Recruiting Officer, New Orleans, Louisiana, May 30th, 1st instead of June 1st, as you will be sent to, I'm not sure, F.T. Devins, is it? Fort Ma Devens in Fort Massachusetts, Devens, Massachusetts, Massachusetts right. instead of Ruston, Louisiana, and it, it was a Walter Jesse thing, but it's pretty nostalgic to see that. That's a long time ago. The fact that you were able to keep all this, you, oh. were, you were very organized, were you? Yes, but you see, at that time, the, the naval base was a uh, big uh, field. Uh, the officers needed rooms for their wives to stay. So my family took in people in two bedrooms and there wasn't much place to, in the house to save everything. So when I came back from the service, they, they were, I had no clothes left and um, just a very few things like that. Mama didn't even keep my letters. I mean, you know, and I guess treasures become treasures years after. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and man, I love to have things of my dad when he was in the war, or the pictures of my mom when she was young. But I guess at the time, like when we we're growing up, you don't think a picture by your first boat really means a whole lot. 
till you get to be later in life and you go, I sure wish I had the picture of that That's right. That boat. And very few people had that I knew had cameras. We didn't get have many pictures anyway. That's right. That's a great point. They, I mean, listen, those were hard times in the in late twenties and through the thirties. When I was teaching school with a high with a four year degree at a high school, my salary was Eighty-one dollars a month, nine months of the year. You were rich. That's right, compared to more, more, a lot of people. That's incredible, I, though, when you think about it. I, I can't get over it. I paid back the money I had borrowed to go to school. I had to uh, take care of all my clothing. I paid room and board at home. And eventually, uh, when another bedroom was added, I, I paid for the bedroom furniture. And I still had a few dollars when I went into the service. I don't know how I did it. I want to go back to something you said, that very few people had cameras. Do you remember the first Polaroid cameras that came out? We never had one of those. No, I, I saw people with them, yes. But with the was... little cubes on the top that when it flashed, it would turn. No. I mean, you only got four flashes per, per tube. You'd have to take the tube off, put it back on. And it was the old Polaroids. No, I, ne I never uh, had anything to do with a Polaroid camera. How about so. the first film cameras? You remember those when they came out where people were walking around and taking film? Because that came out a little later. You know, I saw them uh, at, at the Grand Theater. They uh, had news of the week, uh, seven days of the week or whatever. They had movies, and I, I could see a lot. They, they, those cameras took, but no, I never did see it. So you talk about the Grand Theater. You remember the Grand? Definitely. Remember yeah. the Fox Theater? Then the Fox. And then you uh, remember the Bijou? The Bijou, that burned, yes. Right, and then they had the one right uh, across uh, the... The park, the, the one where the ceiling fell in, yes. That's right. So four theaters in Homer. Right downtown, that's right. And that yeah. was the only place they had to go. Right. That was fun for you, to go to the movies? I never did care for them all that much. Okay. I like to read, and that's what I did a lot of. So you were one of those bookworms that sat in your room and read everything, <laughs> right? Yes, sir. Who's the first president you remember vividly? Franklin Roosevelt, I think. Okay. And if I can get a little personal, who was your favorite president of all time? I did admire Harry Truman. Okay. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a mistake when he became president, but he turned out to be pretty good. Yeah. He, he took the blame. He had been in the military, I guess, and he just, I remember a famous statement he said to one day to the cabinet members when they were dilly-dallying about whether or not they were going to use that bomb in uh, Japan. Right. And they couldn't decide whether they should or they shouldn't. And finally one morning he said, the book stops here. I have made the decision, decision, and I admired him for doing that. Right. You know, my dad talks about that because he was there for the testing of two atomic bombs. He was? he was? He was in the Pacific at Bikini Island. So he was there. He actually put the ships out to test them and all that. But he often told me that if Truman doesn't drop the bomb, that Japan was very formidable and it could have been a whole different outcome. That's right. I agree with that. He said they were tenacious. He said that, that, that was a hard nation to go to war against. So he said, really, that was the only recourse that he had. You would agree with that? I agree with him. Yeah. He, he said he, it was, he was the boss and he was going to make the decision. That's it. Right. What, what was that time like for you when when the United States was deep into war, and then when the war was over, when Japan had surrendered. Take me through that time, and what was that like for you emotionally? At that time, I was learning how to work in an office and learning something about insurance. So I guess I was too busy <laughs> to, to worry about that. You were doing your job, huh? That's right. Well, but, it was all new to me. I had to right. learn how to do everything. But you had to remember the day that the war was over, that Japan surrendered. Well, you know, when you're in the military, celebrations are celebrated with a parade, and I did not like the parades. Okay. For one thing, you had to be in position 
an hour ahead of time and stand and wait and wait and wait for the parade to start and finally the parade would be over. And uh, we had two of them, you know, one on VE day and one on VJ day. And both of them were very hot days. Right. right. You seem like you were a very orchestrated person. That There was not a whole lot of nonsense no. in your life. You did your job. You did what you had to do. And there was not a lot of hoopla. It was what it was. That's right. And that's pretty much how you've led your life. That's right. So if I would ask you, you have a family member here today, and I would get some of your family together, they would say you're pretty straight-laced, right? Well, firm, let's put it that way. Firm. Okay, that's a good word. Firm. Mm -hmm. But I guess... Firm is good a lot of times. You know, I did a lot of babysitting, yeah. but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Now talk about your, your family or your immediate family or your, what, what was your family structure like? We were just a large family. We just all got along. One of the things that uh, my mother insisted on doing in the summertime, instead of playing outside all the time, she would corral all of us and put us around a card table and play rummy and we had to keep school we had to learn arithmetic and i think all of us in the family always did a very good job in arithmetic just letting play cards in the <laughs> <laughs> you still play rummy don't you uh, yes i used to play uh, four different games about eight times a week that tells me something because a lot of people who live long vibrant lives do crossword puzzles, play rummy. Do you think gin rummy might have had something to do with the fact that you are very sharp mentally at 100 years old? I did keep up with the cards as long as I, as long as I could see. I'm very fortunate that I have some good friends and good family members who put up with me and, and let me play cards. I appreciate what they're doing for me now. So you had you were one of six siblings. How many served our country? Oh, all, all six. six. It's incredible. Can you, can you tell us what divisions they were in? My brother Ernest went in first. Uh, he went in a few months before the Japanese bomb for Pearl Harbor, and he was in the Army. He was sent to California, and he was in an anti-aircraft unit. They were guarding the shores of California. And then I went in next, I was in the Army. Then my sister Joyce did, uh, she was a telephone operator. She worked for Western Union and they put her in communications in the States. And then I think Betty was next. She had uh, a year of college and then she, uh, worked for Western Union for a while and decided, I guess, that she wanted, since we were in the service, she wanted to be too, so she joined the Army. And then Ralph joined the Navy. He had a, a little problem. He had been uh, very ill when he was young, and I guess that's what they kept checking to be sure he was okay. But he was determined he was going to be in the Navy, and he spent the whole time he was in the service in the Pacific. In the Pacific. Wow. Now, he would have to be the one with the experiences. How many married in the family? Did everybody get married? Did everybody? I know some, some in the older families are fine. Half of them got married, half didn't get married. <laughs> so what, what was it like in your family? Well, Betty and I never married. All the others did. Joyce didn't have any children, so the, the nieces and nephews were all from my brothers. But I find that sort of common, because in my, my daddy's side of the family, well, my mama had three nuns on her side, so they chose the religious route. But on daddy's side, my grandfather was only one of several to get married. So not getting married was not uncommon. Well, to tell the truth, I think that some of the married couples were glad they had maiden aunts to help with the children. That's a great point because that you hear that a lot. So you might not have married, but you had a lot of kids. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of them brought you to the studio today, right? That's correct. That's mm -hmm. it. So the bonds, the bond, it's still a, a blood bond. Well, now she's taking care of me. I want to jump to recently, 
you were honored at the military museum and we had the parish president here. We'll bring this up full screen. Parish president giving you a proclamation. And the key to the city. And I never knew anybody who had the key to the city. <laughs> well, you have one. I have one. Now, let me ask you, did you go try to see what banks and all that would open up? <laughs> <laughs> As you shot, you can go. I'll bring you one night. We'll see what it opens up. <laughs> and so the, the parish president, Gordon Dove, giving you key to the city. And we have another one here showing a nice cake that they put together. And... What was, what was that like to have, let, let's show this shot. Got a lot of people who were in attendance. That's right. That had to be very special for you. Yes, it was. And I was so surprised that so many were enthusiastic about coming and I just couldn't get over it. How many people came and they were all nice about it. And they remembered so many things that I had forgotten. There were a lot of people that I, I worked with, and of course, I do have a large extended family, so there were a lot of um, relatives there. But Donna told me that there were a few people who heard about the party and called and asked if they could come. I never heard of something like that happening before. <laughs> they wanted to be a part of it. Well, it, it was fun. I enjoyed it very, very much. Now you worked, uh, I recognize Leo Lede. You worked for Lede Insurance for how long? 37 years. So you worked for Leo's dad? That's right. And what were some of your duties at Lede Insurance? Well, first I started out just as a typist and a, a file clerk and so on, and I worked up to office manager. So you were, you were the one in charge? Well, yeah, Leo was out a lot. Mm -hmm. That had to make you feel pretty good that all that training you did, all the clerical things you did in the wax, being a teacher probably got you pretty prepared for being an office manager. Well, it just worked out that way, yes. Yeah. I love the way you're so matter of fact. It just is what it is. It, what is, is. I mean, don't try to change it. You know? There you go. I like that. I see you blowing out the candles here with some young children. I invited all the little ones to come help me blow out the candles, yeah. Did they do a pretty good job? Well, they were pretty quick about it. I think they've all had a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recognize this gentleman from Barrios Subdivision, and, and I, I just learned something new today that your brother lives in Barrios. That's right, uh, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. I, never, I never knew, it's six degrees of separation whenever I do a show. I always learned that somebody was somebody's brother or sister, and I've, I've seen Mr. Jimmy for many, many years because I grew up in Mulberry. Oh. Well. So whenever I'm riding my bike or doing whatever, I would always see Mr. Jimmy. So it, it's ironic that that would take place. But you made it to 100, and I don't say that in a bad way, but you might be the spunkiest 100-year-old person I've ever interviewed you still have a lot of energy. Uh, I might be sitting down with you when you're 110. <laughs> <laughs> you still feeling pretty good? Okay, I'll invite you at 110. <laughs> I also have a, a doctor who told me he wanted to be invited to my 120th. There you go. So, obviously people see something in you, You've, you're well over the norm. And well, did, you, did you have a lot of longevity in the family? Did you have aunts or uncles or parents that lived long? I've, lived, I've, I've thought about that a lot. But you know, young people look upon people who are 60 years old as ancient. I thought they were all very, very old. They probably weren't because I've never found anybody in the family who lived to be 100. I'm not saying that some didn't. I'm just right. saying I haven't found any. Right. But I thought all of the, uh, my uncles and aunts and so on were positively ancient. <laughs> you know, I, I, I got to admit, when I was young and I would have aunts and uncles that were 60, I, was, I, would, I would think they're pretty old. As I'm approaching 60, <laughs> I don't think it's that old. But, you know, really, 
I guess it's how you live your lifestyle. It's what you eat. What did you eat that might be a secret? Did you eat a lot of garden foods, broccoli? Or what, what, was, what was it that might have helped? Nearly uh, everybody had a little garden a long time ago. And we ate whatever was in the garden, uh, a lot of vegetables. In fact, uh, in the Depression in the 30s, a lot of people traded vegetables. You have beans and you have carrots or potatoes or whatever, and that's what we ate. A lot more fresh food than, than canned food, for instance. And of course, there was no, no freezing anything. The first refrigerator we had wasn't a refrigerator. It was a, a large container with a hole in the bottom to, uh, for the ice to drip through. And then in the morning, a man with ice on his cart would come through and sell you 10 cents worth of ice or 20 cents worth of ice, and you'd put it in this container, and that would keep you, uh, your food reasonably cool until the next day the man came back and sold you some more ice. So we didn't have frozen foods. Hence the name Icebox. To this day, I still say, I'm going to the ice box, <laughs> because as a kid, we called it an ice box. Well, that's right, that's what it was. It was a box, a tin line right. box. Right, and, and so I've never changed, and we always said the hose pipe <laughs> instead of the garden hose. I've been criticized for saying that every once in a while, but it, it happens. You've seen a lot of changes in technology, and you've seen a lot of different experiences. But if I had to, narrow down your favorite movie of all time, what would it be? I looked Gone with the Wind, I think, three times, so I guess that would have to be it. So that was your favorite. Mm -hmm. What struck you about that movie? What did you like about it? There were some things in there that sort of struck a memory. You know, uh, my, my grandfather had a plantation on uh, Bonnet Lodge, and that's where we would go in the summertime for our summer vacation. And some things in that movie reminded me of things that happened on that plantation. Was it tough living on the plantation? Were your parents strict? Uh, no, my parents stayed at home with the youngest babies, and the older ones uh, would go out uh, on the plantation, and the, the main aunts and uncles would took care of us, and we had free reign. But everybody pitched in and did whatever? Now, and maybe some of the younger boys did. Right. But uh, I never did anything like that. So you had a pretty good life. I think so. I'm yeah. very thankful for what I have had. Absolutely. Now, if I had to ask you your favorite song of all time. <laughs> I'm not musically inclined. No favorite song that you listen no. to that, you, no. that ever struck you? One time when I was in the service, I was put on a, a, a program where you had to identify songs. I couldn't identify one of them. And several of the people in the program looked at me as though there was something wrong with me. Well, I just was never musically inclined. All right, well now, I know you're gonna be able to answer this one. What's your favorite book that you've read of all time? I liked almost every one. I like to know what's going on, and I do like historical novels, even if I know a lot of it's not true. You took all your nieces and nephews on, on trips? On trips, that's correct. And when we went to a foreign country, they had to handle the foreign money, and uh, when we came back, they had to fill, fill in their own uh, immigration forms and, and go through line and everything. I made them, even though they were like maybe 14 years old, they had to do it that way. They had to learn about other countries and learn how to do things and take care of themselves. In Donna's case, I took her to the South Pacific. First, you wouldn't believe this, we went to the Fiji Islands because that was on the tour. Right. Then we went to New Zealand and Australia and Tahiti. You can't do much in two weeks, so right. that was it. I took uh, one niece for two weeks to Italy, another week, niece for two weeks to uh, France. I uh, took uh, Carol to the uh, Scandinavian countries. I took uh, two to Mexico and uh, two on a Caribbean trip. But I wanted them to learn it's something besides right here. You know, learn something about the world. Broaden their horizons. That's right. At 100, you got to see a lot of things that a lot of people 
never saw. And you've been able to, to go back to days where there were no phones, and then you had party lines, mm -hmm. and now there's cell phones. Can I ask you, do you have a cell phone? No. Are you interested in getting a cell phone? No. I knew you would say that. Simplicity seems to be right up your alley. Well, I don't need one. I'm home all, nearly all the time. You know, I, I know some people that got to have everything through life, but you chose to, li to lead. And I don't say simple in a bad way. I say simple, uncomplicated. That's right. Everything is simple. You try to keep your life uncomplicated, don't you? <laughs> that's right. And maybe that's, that's why you, you're doing so well. Well, I'm thankful I can do what I do. Right. Is this your first time on television? Yes. Were you nervous? No. You didn't seem nervous at all. So you slept last night knowing you would come in and do a one-hour interview? I slept well last night, yes. <laughs> all right. I'm glad, because I'd hate to, for you to have been nervous. Did you enjoy being on TV? Oh, yes. This has been very, very interesting. Let me say this. I think you might not have think you had something important, but a lot of people who love you and admire you probably think different. They probably think you had a lot of things to well, offer. I, I hope so. But I, I, like I tell you about this party last Sunday, I just can't get over the, the, the people who came out of out of the woodwork, uh, people I hadn't seen in 40 and 50 years. And it was like meeting them again yesterday. Right. It, it was also very, very nice. And you don't miss a lick when you see these people. You, you take, you, you catch up from right where you left off, right? In many cases, yes. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, oftentimes I remember, for instance, for the women, the unmarried name, I have a little trouble remembering the married name. Right. But, uh, I remembered most of them, yes. My final question would be, if I got all your relatives together and I got them all in a room and I said, I want y'all to come up with one word that would describe Ms. Parr. What, what do you think or hope that the one word they would use to describe you would be? I, I think we all get along very well and, I don't know, just enjoy each other's company. And I have a lot of good cooks. Donna is one of them. And uh, right now she is seeing the, to my meals and she insists I eat vegetables and fruit and things like that, which I enjoy, enjoy anyway, except right. broccoli, I don't like it. You know what word I would use? Mm. Modest. Oh, wow. Well. You're very modest. There's not a whole lot of fanfare with you. You don't brag a lot, although I know you've done a lot more than you portray, but it, it just doesn't seem that important to you, although it's very important to us. No, not really. Just one day at a time, what happens, happens. It is what it is. That's right. I want to thank you for being on the program today and thank you for spending time. It's been a joy. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. Really. All right, so before you leave, I want to bring in our our, our crew, we have a, a little something for you. We got you a little dessert that you can bring home with you. Oh, okay? I... So Joni's going to come on board. She's going to walk in on the screen. And we we'll let you hold that cake. And so we got you a cake for your birthday. I know you had a big cake yes, for your delicious. birthday before. Yes. But we wanted to give you our own cake. Now, I hope you like chocolate. I love chocolate. From the crew at HTV, we want to thank you for your years of service, not only as a teacher in the, in the service, but we want to thank you for what you've meant to our community. So we got you an extra cake in case you ran out from the big cake that you had already. <laughs> that cake went fast. It was a delicious cake. Yeah. Well, maybe you could share that with Donna mm -hmm. and a few other people, but thank you so much, and we enjoyed having you. Happy birthday. Well, thank you very much. And welcome back to Buy Your Time. I'm Martin False. And I didn't have a chance to make it to the birthday party yesterday, but I did have a chance to FaceTime Miss Frances Poor. And if you can recall, we had her on TV for her 100th birthday. Well, yesterday, and the reason I couldn't make it, I was caught 
at the Irish Italian Parade, and of course, they closed the streets. But in my FaceTime chat with Ms. Parr, she was turning 104 years young. That's right, 104 years young. If you recall, I had Ms. Parr on my one-on-one -on -one, uh, several years ago in 2018, and she always credited living a long life to being single, to walking everywhere she went. And yesterday, her family and friends gathered to pay their respect, respect to a woman that has been so involved in a lot of their lives. And it was a happy occasion as Miss Frances Parr turned 104 years young. Let's listen in. Well, I always lived in Homer. And we did not have a car, so I walked wherever I went. And the doctors to this day say that's why I'm enjoying good health. Mm -hmm. I don't take any prescribed medicines. I started out at St. Francis Girls School, the one that was torn down. And then I went, of course, to Terrebonne High. And I graduated when I was barely 17. And when I started teaching, I was barely 19, teaching some of the pupils who were there when I was in school. And then after that, I joined the service, and I joined the uh, WAX, and spent two years in Italy during the war. It was a very interesting experience, I'll tell you. And I've, I always have been very curious. So whenever I had a few hours off, I would get a little handbook and walk around Naples and find interesting places. And then when I had a chance to go somewhere, a different place, I always took that opportunity. And as a result, I went to Egypt and Palestine when I was in the army in, in uh, Italy. And so I continued traveling when I started working. And I took a few pupils with me. I wanted them to travel and see the world and know there was some place besides Louisiana. I went two places I was almost sorry I had gone. One of them was Panama. I saw the people were so poor there and didn't, didn't fix up the places at all. And the worst place was Greenland. Well, after the war, I did not go back to teaching. I went into the insurance business and that was very interesting. It was something entirely different. I had never worked in an office before, and I learned how to work in an office. And I found that much easier than teaching school. I couldn't believe that uh, had there had been so many changes while I was away. And I was away just a little over two years. But really, it was, uh, every, uh, we didn't have a loaf of bread for 10 cents anymore. We had to pay more than that for a loaf of bread. But I never did drive, and I never did want to drive, and I never wanted a car. It would not do any good because I lived and worked and went to school always within three blocks of where I lived. So I would have had to park the car at home anyway. Yeah. But I had very good friends and very good relatives who took me with them quite often when they didn't want somebody to accompany them somewhere. I really appreciated all of that. One of the things I wanted to say in the previous in interview was how people learned who died and when was the funeral years ago when we didn't even have telephones. There, there were no uh, funeral homes. The funeral was always the next day or maybe the same day. And they would give the printer the name of the person who died, when he died, and when the funeral would be. I moved four times due to Ida, and I don't know where, excuse me, where anything is. But I'll, I'll get find them. I'll live long enough to find a few things anyway. We were very fortunate to be able to have, get together for my Aunt Frances Moore's 104th birthday. I could only wish that I lasted that long. We always say it was because she never got married, never had children, and walked wherever she went. So hopefully the par genes will carry on. So if we could, let me just sing happy birthday to her. Are you ready? All right.
We'd like to congratulate Ms. Parr on her birthday. Certainly a tremendous feat here in the area. And by the grace of God, she's still doing very well. In my chat with her by phone, she does really, really well. And certainly we want to congratulate her on behalf of HTV and the entire crew. I want to thank Jason Serenier for going out there and filming that birthday party. As you could tell, it was well attended and she deserves it. She's been a tremendous asset to us here in the parish. Just something you need to know, she served in World War II as a member of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or what they call the WAX. So she's also a teacher at heart. She was a teacher at a young age, and she worked in the insurance industry after returning home from World War II. And I'll tell you what, she just did a tremendous job uh, with her life here in Terrebonne Parish, and we are so privileged and happy to have shown Miss Parr's birthday party on HTV. We'll be right back. All right, and welcome to Bayou Time, and what a great day to celebrate a birthday. Now, it's one thing to turn 100 years old, and we've covered many of those, but it's another thing to turn 105, and certainly that happened this weekend. On Saturday at the Homestead Assisted Living Facility, family and friends of Ms. Frances Parr celebrated her 105th birthday. If you recall, Ms. Parr has been a guest of mine on 101, and we covered her 104th birthday last year, along with a couple of birthdays before that. This year, we asked Ms. Parr about turning 105. Oh, all the bones ache. But I'm walking very slowly and do it as well as I can. I've lived at home all my life. And I never had a car, so I walked the streets of Hubble and knew a lot of people that had long gone. Finished college and taught at Terrebonne High for six years. But in the summertime, I had uh, summertime jobs. The most interesting one was going, uh, it was in Washington, D.C., when I worked for the uh, Department of the Treasury. I went into service, and I was in Europe for two years during the war. When I went into the service, I did uh, office work, uh, mostly uh, writing articles that came back to the States about people that I, I were in the same area where I was. And, and after that, I went to work for an insurance a, a company downtown Hobo until I had to retire when I lost, began to lose my sight. I think it was nice of them to take time out of their busy lives and to come. And they've done that three times now. That's enough. The 100 and 103 Four. was it? And, 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 uh, and this one. That's enough. People are going to get tired of seeing my face. I even got a gift from a lady I don't know and who doesn't know me, but she saw me on Facebook. I thought it was very nice of her to send, to send me something when she didn't even know me. We also spoke to the family and friends of Ms. Parr about this great celebration. I'm Donna, I am her niece, and she's taking care of us all our lives. She's always done good things for us, so now we're taking care of her. And she's 105 now, so. She'll make it to 110, I'm sure. This is, this is Jamie Parr and my dad, Jimmy Parr, who's 95 years old, at his sister Frances Marie's 105th birthday. Uh, the youngest of the six siblings, and Miss Frances is the oldest of the six. Proud to have her as an aunt. I read a I read a uh, article recently where she mentioned bringing all of her nieces and nephews uh, on trips, and I'm one of those benefactors. She brought me to Disney World. And she brought a cousin and I on a cruise. We love her very much and want to wish her a great 105th birthday. I'm just glad she's still living. Okay. 106. Not many people get there. My name is Derek Bovelin. That's my wife, Emily. Um, Miss Mimi, to me, is uh, 105 years old. Uh, I am her great nephew. 
Uh, I wish, I hope I have that gene to live 105 years old. I think it's great. Uh, one of my fondest memories is, um, I think when I was out of school, um, my mom and dad used to send me to her house because uh, she didn't have any kids. So I would go to her house and watch The Price is Right uh, during the day and um, eat lean cuisines. She was always great to me, uh, sent me to Washington, D.C. for close up. Uh, so I, I appreciate her very much. She's a very smart lady, traveled the world. She has a memory like no other. My name is Robert Parr. I'm a, a nephew of uh, Mimi. And uh, back in the early 70s, she took my cousin, my cousin and I to Mexico. We got to go to Mexico City, Guadalajara, and uh, Acapulco. And that's a trip that I would have never gotten to go on if it hadn't been for her. She seemed to have made it a mission to take uh, my cousins one or two at a time on different trips around the world. I know my brother got to go to Europe and uh, he, she took my sister to, uh, to France and uh, different cousins got to go to different places around the world. And it's all because of her, all because of Mimi. I'm Barbara, and I'm a cousin of Frances Marie's. And we have been friends and cousins and insurance agent. And um, I visit her often, and she has a lot of great stories to tell. I am Lisa Mar Parr Miranda. I am Frances Parr's niece. And we have grown up with her. She was a great babysitter to us, taking care of us for many years, telling us wonderful stories about World War II and all of the travels that she did. Um, the air raids when she was in London, um, having to take baths in pith helmets, and how much she learned to love to travel from that trip. She still tells wonderful stories, and we're very thankful that she's still with us. Um, she credits her long life to never being married and never having children. But longevity does run in our family. My father turned 95 this year. Ms. Farr is just an amazing woman. Every day I'm here, I take time out to sit and visit with Ms. With Ms. Francis, and she is just amazing. And if ever she forgets something, she's very upset about it. So I have to tell all the time, don't be upset about it. I never know where my phone or my keys are. And she laughs, and we have a meeting almost every time, every day that I'm here. And I learn so much from her, and I feel so blessed to have known her. Let me sit right here real quick. Okay, ready, y'all? Happy birthday to you. Congratulations, Ms. Parr. Happy birthday. We'll be back with a lot more.